Welcome to Labor on the Job. I'm the host, Steve Zeltzer. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the issue of health and safety, uh, Workers Memorial Day, uh, health care, and the state of uh, workers in California and nationally, and what's been happening with Cal OSHA. So, uh, joining us tonight uh, uh, first is uh, Dr. Larry Rose. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rose. Thank you. And you're a, you're a retired doctor from Cal OSHA. Yes, uh, I worked 28 years at Cal OSHA as the chief of the medical unit, and uh, I retired about a year and a half ago. I see. Welcome to the show. Thank you, doctor. Also joining us is Daniel Berman. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Nice to be here. And it's you're, not the first time. I hope it's not the last. And you're the author of a book, uh, Death on the Job. You want to hold that up, Jan? Okay. Which is a very good primer. You, you hold it flat. Okay. You can, you can put it down there. Okay. Thanks for joining us. And also joining us is Sandy Tran. Welcome to the show, Sandy. Thank you, Steve. Very, very pleasure to be here. And you're the uh, mother of a uh, worker who was injured at AgriQuest, David yes, Bell. Yes, I am. Okay. Good. Uh, well, why don't we start first with uh, the development of Cal OSHA and health and safety standards. And Dan, you worked uh, with uh, Tony Mazzocchi and you've worked with healthcare professionals around the country in fighting to establish standards for workers. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, just the idea of having standards that, that uh, uh, all businesses and industries have to uh, have to respect uh, was actually a great leap forward under the Occupational Safety and Health Act because before okay. that, before that, all the uh, standards were uh, so-called uh, voluntary. They had uh, standards called the threshold limit values, and they were uh, recommended, but there was no way to enforce them. And so, for example, and what happened was the standards were basically set. Uh, uh, by uh, industry groups and for example in the case of asbestos there were uh, 12 fibers of 2 micrograms uh, and smaller per cubic centimeter of air. Well as soon as they started looking into it and people became more and more aware that, that any exposure to asbestos was problematic, uh, little by little the standard was reduced to point uh, uh, 0.1 fibers per cubic centimeter of air. That is, they were reduced by a factor of 120 times. And uh, this happened with uh, m many other standards. Uh, but it has been a constant struggle, not only to get the idea of standards accepted, to get standards passed that would protect workers, and then once that happened, get them enforced. But wasn't there always the argument it's going to cost too much and cost versus you know the the safety of the worker is that is that was that always an argument in fighting for this protection of standards and, and the development of OSHA nationally well that's that's always been the argument and uh, what uh, the way industry handled it in the case of uh, innumerable substances and once again we can talk about asbestos because people have heard about it what they do is uh, set up their own uh, industry supported uh, uh, institutions which will uh, claim first of all that there uh, are no problems with uh, and then secondly uh, if, if it's finally determined that there are problems uh, the idea is to set a standard that uh, it's very easy, very easy to meet and then the third thing that's done is to to try to prevent the standard from being enforced particularly by the workers one of the the greatest uh, the greatest uh, uh, forward steps under OSHA was the ability of uh, any worker in any union to call in an inspector who could uh, visit a plant unannounced because historically uh, the bosses would know when, when an inspector was coming to the plant and if there was a dangerous operation they just turn it down and I saw this uh, before the passage of the OSHA law in uh, early 1970 in uh, Herculaneum, Missouri. I went to, uh, there was an inspection of a uh, lead smelter and of course the company knew 40 or 50 minutes beforehand that, in, uh, that the head of industrial inspection, uh, Mr. Flexenhar from the state of Missouri was coming to, ta was coming to, the, to the plant and so they, they shut down the, the, the uh, uh, slowed down the smelter so much that there was uh, a very little uh, sulfur dioxide uh, being uh, emitted at at the plant site. Is it, is it illegal to do that? It wasn't illegal then. Is it illegal now? 
It's illegal, but it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And wasn't there supposed to be protections for workers who complain about health and safety problems? Or was that part of the legislation? Well, it's part of the legislation. And uh, I, I, I think uh, Dr. Rose could answer this uh, 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 better than I could as a, as a uh, retired Cal OSHA person. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, a worker makes a complaint, they're supposed to be protected. But in fact, in many cases, they are not. And certainly, in every case that I know about in which a worker is not a member of a union, they're not protected. And I remember specifically a case uh, here in San Francisco. A friend of mine was working at a photo shop, and she, uh, she would basically get drunk every day from exposure to uh, the chemicals in the, um, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, development process. And I said, uh, well, Debbie, you know, you can, make, you can file a Cal OSHA complaint, but I guarantee you, you're going to be fired. And she said, well, I can live with that. She, she, was, uh, uh, she still had another, uh, she had another job lined up. She says, I'll take the hit. And she, 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 she called the inspector. The inspector came. She did lose her job, but she went on to her next job. She didn't have any, she didn't have any children. She, she had some bills, but she had another job lined up. And of course, she took, she took the company to court and she got $600 uh, back pay, but that's all she got. And, uh, but that's, that's just the way it works. And so, so employers can get away with it, basically. They can get away with it, particularly in a non-union in, in in non situation in general. Right. And what, what we recommend, what we used to recommend when I worked for uh, oil, chemical, and atomic workers, and what uh, the uh, health research group uh, used to recommend was, you know, be prepared to lose your job uh, if you file a complaint, and they know who filed the complaint, and if you, if you're okay with that, doesn't matter what the law is, and the most you can probably get back is uh, lost wages. Okay, and we're going to talk about what happened to uh, to David Bell, who was an employee at uh, Agriquest when he did make complaints. Um, so, but we have an idea here of uh, some serious problems, it seems endemic problems, uh, with OSHA and with the protection of workers who complain about health and safety. Now, Dr. Rose. Um, you started at uh, Cal OSHA, and you were saying there that uh, when, how, how many people were, worked there? Or how long did you work there? When did you get on board at Cal OSHA? <laughs> yes, well, when I started, there were 11 million California workers, and they were all covered except for agricultural workers. No, uh, that was in the Jerry Brown administration. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there were six doctors uh, in the medical, called the medical unit, mm -hmm. and there were well over. Uh, two to three hundred uh, what we call uh, compliance officers, industrial hygienists. Now why would you need a doctor at Cal OSHA? Well it's critical because there, there are a lot of areas. The, the compliance officers are industrial hygienists and they're not trained at all in, in uh, medicine. Uh, they don't know how to read a medical record. They know nothing about infectious diseases. And, uh, and we also inspect hospitals and medical facilities of all sorts. Uh, so and you need a trained physician or a trained um, professional, medical professional. Absolutely. Really. The title In, was public health medical officer, and uh, we were all had that title. I see. Yes. And uh, there were six uh, doctors. Right. For the whole state working, of California. For the whole state of California. Both south and north and uh -huh. central valley, yes. Uh, slowly as we had, it, it was always a very political agency. And as uh, Republicans came into office, first Duke Majin and then there were, uh, Wilson, uh, they kept, the, as the doctors retired or left, they would not replace them. And finally, at the last five to eight years, I was the only doctor there. So, uh, so for how many for workers state, now? And now 17 million workers. So 17 million workers in California and on only one doctor. One doctor for, for the OSHA program. Of, of California. Of California. And there were two nurses too, uh, somewhat trained, but not with the same, couldn't uh, operate with the same authority that a doctor could. No, but uh, there seem to be more inspectors and people for fish and game than there is for. Well, as one of the inspectors who I highly respect said, uh, death by a thousand cuts. What they were doing was they were shrinking the compliance force, the compliance officers who were the industrial hygienists. They were uh, slowly allow, not, not hiring, doing new hires. Uh, and now we're down to really uh, well below uh, any standard, either the Fed OSHA standard or the adjacent state standards, like say, the number of 
inspectors per worker, uh, say in Washington or Oregon, we're well below that now. Uh, we're, we're, well, it's well really why, haven't the, why haven't the unions in California made an issue of this? I mean, you would think that they would say, look, we right. need more doctors, we need more inspectors. When I first came on board, it, it's like almost night and day. When I first came on board with, during the Jerry Brown administration, uh, we were the prime OSHA, state OSHA programs. We were setting new standards. We were out there really uh, doing uh, excellent work. Uh, gradually, that diminished and uh, with political appointees from the various governors. And your question was again? Well, why hasn't this been an issue in the trade union movement ah, in California? Yeah. So I started to say, so in the beginning, I well remember, I was working with several of the largest unions, their health and safety officers. As the union uh, membership shrunk in relation to the, particularly the private workforce, uh, the, the uh, health and safety officers in the big unions kind of disappeared, and I wasn't seeing them anymore. And the act activity, the, the awareness of the unions was uh, almost inapparent after a while. It just, and at this point, uh, I, have, I had at the end, the last five years when I was alone there, uh, there was almost no union contact except when I uh, joined the San Francisco Labor Council and uh, you introduced me to various union members in the But Bay you area. didn't have any contact with the unions in California? No, the they, they just broke off contact. And particularly, I, I was shocked by the lack of interest by the Labor Federation in the strength of Cal OSHA. Yeah. Sure. Now, one of the things that you were involved in is uh, studying uh, the history of disease, uh, particular industries. And why don't you talk about your experience with IBM? Because there, they had some cancer outbreaks and, and other uh, systemic problems in this particular industry, the, the uh, electronics industry. Yeah, uh, IBM is a, is a good example of what would I, I would call a failure in adequately uh, uh, regulating what they were doing. And they put out uh, in the drinking water and throughout the environment of, of uh, Silicon Valley, they were putting out carcinogens in the uh, solvents they were using, and the workforce was getting exposed. And so later on, uh, there was some legal action by uh, a public interest group down there, uh, Santa Clara Kosh, it was called, and uh, some lawyers. And they were trying to find out how many of the workers got cancer so they could, you know, and that would have a, a definite uh, I put, impact on the awareness of the community. That, because many people were exposed outside the workplace there. So when I was working at Cal OSHA, I tried to get those medical records. OSHA has the medical records, are supposed to have access to the medical records of any uh, big uh, corporation like IBM, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to come forth and give them. So when I went to the uh, administration of OSHA and I said, I want to see those records, they said, no, we can't do that because they're under our STAR program, uh, self-regulation, uh, and they're one of the many, and, um, and uh, we're not going to ask for those records. And so, I was really shocked by that. So you as a doctor that. for Cal OSHA, you find th this company uh, in this important industry, very powerful industry in California and in the United States, the, te the technology industry, where there are serious health and safety problems. You ask for some records. Right. Of, of workers who've been medical uh, records, medical that, records they have, uh, that they have, that they're required to have. They're required to have, have. They're required to have and, and they have and, them. Yeah. And they say, we're in a volunteer compliance agreement with the state of California, so basically, we don't have to give you the records. Well, that's what was told to me, and they said also, we're, we're, there's litigation, and, and we're not going to give them to you. And, and that's actually uh, was illegal, but I couldn't get back up from the present administration at Cal OSHA particularly the chief, uh, I won't mention his name, but you I think he's You can mention his a, name. That's all okay. right, Len Welch, and I think okay. he's a disgrace. I'll so Len Welch, loud. So, well, there was another issue of popcorn. Why don't you talk about the popcorn case? Well, yeah, and then more recently, as I was leaving the agency, this shocking event occurred, which is, it's called diacetyl, and it's put in a lot of food, but particularly it was put in popcorn. And the popcorn workers were making this greasy stuff with the diacetyl as a, it's a flavoring agent, that goes on popcorn when you go to the movies, for example. It goes to a lot of other popcorn, consumer popcorn, too. And what happened it's to the work... It's a buttering agent, It's right? a buttering agent, right. Yeah. And it's put in a lot of food. And what happened was workers who were working with this got the most incredibly devastating lung disease uh, that just wiped out their lungs. Uh, and in order to uh, 
do anything medically, they actually needed lung transplants. And uh, I assumed that Cal OSHA was going to do something about it. And uh, Len Welch said, no, we don't have to. They have, we have an industry doctor who will look it over. And uh, uh, notoriously, of course, industry doctors have always protect So the, the industry. industry doctor will take care of it. Right. You can relax. And that's know. what happened. And nothing, and virtually very little, if anything, has happened protecting the workers and the public. So, so basically, it sounds like as a result of the uh, destruction, really, of Cal OSHA, of the health and safety problem. They've turned it over to the company doctors to take care of workers. That's what he said. He said, no, we don't have to, we don't need doctors anymore. We, we could use the, uh, the industry doctors. The industry, they'll, they'll take care of it. Now, now um, Dan, I mean, is this a surprise to you? This is just a shock to me. And I, I'm a, I've been a little, to be honest with you, I, except for following up and, and working on asbestos bans uh, worldwide, I've turned my attention in the last 15 years or so to issues of of uh, energy, public control of energy, public power, and that sort of thing. But I'm, I, 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 I got a kind of a reminder of all this, a wake-up call. I, um, a la early September, I got a call from an, uh, an attorney in Oakland who said, uh, I want to talk to you about something you wrote over 30 years ago. And it was a paper I'd written on the uh, occupational disease and, and public policy lead poisoning in Missouri and it's, it's just a term paper I wrote as a political science graduate student and I, f I followed this is the biggest lead smelter in the United States St. Joe Mineral, Mineral Corporation in Herculaneum Missouri and I, I had gone to, to a meeting in late 1969 OSHA wasn't passed uh, until late 1970 it went into enforcement in April 1971 the workers there at this giant lead smelter were guys in their late 20s and early 30s. They were complaining that they couldn't get their wife pregnant, wives pregnant and that they, and these are exact, the exact words, they couldn't get it up. That is, they, they couldn't become, have sex. They're becoming they, sterile. They were becoming, becoming no, not sterile. only sterile, impotent. Impotent, impotent as they a result of their... They couldn't have sex and they suspected it was because of their exposure to lead. So they right. asked the company and the company had a company doctor. They were doing blood level, lead levels, urine lead levels, the company said, we own, and it cost a couple of hundred dollars per, 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 uh, per, per exam, said, we own this information. We're not giving it to you. And for two years, and this is before OSHA, in, 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 in 68 and 69, they had tried to get the company to give them uh, this information, and it was, ab it was absolutely turned down. OSHA was passed in order to resolve these kinds of problems. And I feel maybe it's time to write a second edition of this book, Death on the Job, because, and, and follow up with uh, the... the, the, the um, because it sounds like the gains that were made, the movement that developed uh, in labor to educate people to really take this thing forward, now it's, we're going back. Is that... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's shocking to me. And I, I, I mean, I, uh, on one level, I'm not surprised because I remember writing and I actually... It, sat down and I'm reading my own book. I've never actually sat down and read it cover to cover. And uh, and, I remember, and I do make the point that in a period in which the labor movement is losing power, losing numbers, uh, 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 becoming a smaller and smaller proportion of the workforce, it seems unlikely that enforcement of uh, occupational health and safety standards is going to move forward. The workforce is going to be more cowed, more frightened, and uh, and that seems to be uh, from 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 this story, from this popcorn story, precisely what's uh, happening. Uh, of course, the labor movement in California has grown. The membership has gone up relative to other labor movements around the around the country, actually. So the percentage. No, of, but in terms of percentage of people yeah. organize today compared to the percentage of people that's organized true. back a, in a 1968 decline. when that's, I was looking, right. and that's what I'm talking about. Now, uh, uh, Sandy, um, you. Uh, uh, live in, in, uh, in up in the Sacramento area, and yes, I do. and your son uh, David Bell was going to Sacramento State. Exactly. And it, what was he studying there? Um, he was he got he ended up finishing and and he got a major in biology with a minor in chemistry. I see. Science, bachelor of science. So he wanted to work in in biotechnology in the biotechnology industry. Well, when he yes, he did. He wanted to help the world. I see. And he decided that he was going to apply for a job, and he got a job with a company called AgriQuest. Yes, he did. And when was this? For To get some experience. He started in uh, 1998, August the 10th. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I guess he was pretty excited that he was going to get this job and. Oh, no, he was just elated that you know that he was on the cutting edge of technology and you know there was new things that was happening and he was like I said he was going to help save the world, he was going to rid everything of pesticides and make foods more available to the world. Now this company that he worked for, AgriQuest, uh, who was this owned by? Yeah, it was started uh, by Pam Marone, who used to be from Ma Monsanto. And she took in two other people with her and I can't remember the exact names, but three founding scientists. So it was a startup in. company. And these people were from uh, Monsanto. Many of these people were from Monsanto who came over to start this new company. Well, after Monsanto, she had started another company. And then from there, she went. She started AgriQuest. And, and what was their focus as a as, uh, startup company in, in developing new products? Well, what they wanted to do is that they wanted to find novel microorganisms. In fact, they, they boast about it in articles and interviews that they've searched the globe over. Um, they use microbe hunters, and then what they do is they bring in, um, say, soil samples. And within the soil samples, they try to find the novel microorganism that's going to be used as a pesticide, insecticide, fungicide, mycocide. And this is what's being put on our crops. So uh, they were using this, this bacteria and, and, uh, uh, and fungus uh, as a means of, of fighting pesticides. Well, they wanted to find the novel one you know, that hasn't been discovered before. And they would get patents for it. And, and then well, get, uh, they would do that, but um, not only would they find them, but they would mutate them, they would mix them with chemicals, with other microorganisms, and they would mutate them um, up is to this three called generations. Genetic, is this called genetic engineering? Well, they deny that it's genetic engineering. What do they say it is? It's, it's organic, it's natural. That's what they say. You know, you can have as, as little as one point say seven percent or seventy percent of any type of microorganism and consider it, it's a, the only thing that you have to prove is the active ingredient oh, i see so everything else if you really look at the patents i mean they're mixing them with chemicals and other microorganisms and they're mutating the mutants and then mutating those mutants now now uh dr rose uh what is this? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it sounds like it's a hype to me that in terms of calling it organic, first off. If you're using pathogenic organisms, that's not exactly organic. That's a risk not only to the environment, the, the workers, but also to possibly the food consumers as well. So they're not, they're, this is false propaganda they're putting out, is that what well, you're saying? Well, it sounds that way. I would have to look at it closer because I, I wasn't there doing a full investigation. I, you know, this happened after I left, but it's very suspicious. And this is, I mean, we're talking about a major industry, multi-billion dollar industry. Well, I mean, the biotech I I industry in California is, is a big industry. I mean, we're talking big investment, uh, all kinds of products are being developed. Now, Now he began to work there, and what did he notice uh, that was going on there that brought him some concern? Well, I mean, after coming from, and, and what he had done is he had taken a break from mm -hmm. Sac State to take this job. He was supposed to order some type of safety thing, and he was told specifically, do not order biohazard signs because they won't go, look good for the tours. What tours? Well, Pam Marone was, everybody was touring from what I understand, but Pam Marone at that time was still trying to collect investors. So people were coming in. David's major project was, well, he was hired. It was called the Laginex Project. And what they do, it's a strain of Laginanum gigantium. And I may be saying that wrong, that's, doctor. That's right. But what they do is that he was brought in to find a stabilizing or a viable agent to be mixed with this fungus. This fungus was to be used as vector control, all right, as it ate the mosquitoes from the inside out. Well, when David was there, what he did is he had actually, I don't know how he did it, but he had taken the microscope and put it on video and it actually shows the mosquito being eaten from the inside out. And then they found out later, he was told it was safe. And then they found out later, um, Amy Gruders, I believe it was, that it was uh, killing dogs and it was a human pathogen. It was a new, oh, what did they say, omyocyte? 
Uh huh. So, so this is, I mean, so you're talking about some serious uh, chemistry and, 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 and engineering uh, with uh, fungus, with bacteria that they're involved in developing these products. And it, and it sounds like there's a lack of uh, really interest in making sure that everyone is aware and is prepared uh, if these things got out in the environment. Well, now, you know, as Pam Arona stated, this is the first time this has ever been done. I might uh, inject here that the way the way they classify uh, biosafety in labs is they, they classify it one through four. Say the most hazardous, uh, say like anthrax, would be uh, a four. And so you have to have like spacesuits and total control. Now if these were pathogens he was working with, it sounds like that should rate very high in biosafety requirements. And they didn't have masks except for one guy well, that was working doctor, they Respirators. Didn't, respirators. Yeah, yeah right. respirators. They didn't know. They were, everybody was told this stuff was safe. Of course, the scientists, you know, that were working at AgriQuest also were on the patents or on patents with other companies listed as assignees, you know. Um, they know what was going on, but the average, I mean, he was hired as assistant researcher, and he was told everything was safe. So he began to... Uh have serious concerns about the health and safety practices of this company. And uh, now, um, Dr. Rose, if a, an industrial hygienist went into this laboratory, and this laboratory was in a uh, residential neighborhood. Oh, geez. Uh, it was located in Office Park on the corner of Kennedy and J Street, Suite Fours, where they started. And it's a residential area with apartments right across the street. I mean, it's. And they had drains that were dumping into to the ground? Well, they center. had. David was instructed, he was told to pick up this drum that was on an over, um, off-site farm because they wanted to use this drum for other broth, fermentation broth. So what he did is he went over to this farm and he brought it back and there was still liquid in it. So he didn't really know what he was supposed to do. So he was told to clean it out and dump it down the drain. What drain? Well, outside the lab. And I, did, I went up there after this because I was trying to visualize in my mind, he's telling me that they mixed up powder in the bathroom and that the only ventilation was the bathroom fan, which is a normal household fan, okay? So I'm trying to visualize this, and when I get there, I'm going, what drain? And I wasn't the only one that was there, so there was somebody with me. It's like, what drain? And I, I don't see a drain. And it's like, well, I wonder if that's what David's talking about. And what it was is it was like a storm drain right outside the lab door that had just been hollowed into the concrete. And it led right into the dirt. So when I called up David, I go, is this the drain you're talking about? He says, yeah. And excuse the expression, okay. I go, you dumped it out there? And he said, that's where we dumped everything. I said, what the hell did you do that for? That's where we dumped everything, Mom. That's where I was told to dump everything. So they were right they were dumping the, the, the material that they were that they were using in, in the, into the ground in a in a residential neighborhood. They didn't know what was was in that material. Well, it uh, it I, did have the name Germany, and I think it was AQ one five three or QST one five three. And and also I understand there were suitcases of dirt coming into the. Uh, laboratory and they, they didn't, uh, people, some of the workers were joking about that they got it through without going through customs and they had snuck I'm it through. I'm not sure if it's before David was ill or after David was ill, okay, but he had witnessed a green suitcase that was sitting on the lab, on the, on the lab counter, and it had a couple of bags of soil in it or a big bag of soil. And they were laughing and he said it was about the time of the mad cow thing that was going on, and he overheard them laughing about how they had smuggled it through customs, you know, and I've researched the person who brought this in, and I've researched and where he was coming from at that particular time, actually it was 1998, was South America. Did you get a country? It's a big continent. She, I don't know if she's... You know what, I can't remember right but now, anyway, but I can anyway, find it. I get the idea. But Dr. Rose, I mean, it sounds like we've got some serious uh, problems as far as oversight, as far as protection. Right. As, I mean, and, and this is not the only company that's doing this kind of work. I mean, yeah. if, if they're using potentially uh, pathogenic uh, microorganisms, 
the spread on uh, you know vast areas of the environment uh, in relation to say specific what they call pests. Uh, the first thing you'd have to determine if OSHA went in there, and what I can, I'll get the record, but from what I can tell, the first thing they would have had to have was either a microbiologist or a doctor, a public health doctor, to look at how pathogenic are these organisms? Are they as bad as, say, anthrax? Could they be? And then you have to determine, do they have the proper level of biosafety? And then you don't go and just you know, look at the face velocity of a vertical laminar flow hood, that's nonsense. What you do is then you, you, you go back and you say, you've got the wrong level, you cite them, and you require them to get the right level of biosafety and, and the other things, not spread the agent around in the neighborhood. And that would be the approach. And if they don't have a doctor at Cal OSHA to do that, or, you know, then, you know, now, now they're going Dan, in blind. I mean, I mean, this whole issue of, of, for example, the regulation of this industry, uh, the the biotech industry and and genetic, where there's genetic engineering is taking place. I mean, is this part of the problem that this deregulatory atmosphere has created a situation where basically nobody's in charge? Is that really what's going on? In, in as far as it sounds like, uh, this is not an isolated incident. That products are being brought in, they're being developed uh, genetically, and and in an atmosphere in which there really isn't the oversight. Well, I can't. I don't know anything about this specific case. All I know is historically that uh, the where industry faces some kind of threat, uh, say in the case of the uh, the hard rock mining industry, uh, um, there was a there was a very famous disaster in the 30s called the Gauley Bridge disaster. The uh, industry responded by creating the Industrial Hygiene Foundation which became associated with the Mellon Institute in the, in the late 30s or early 40s. And they hired their own doctors to do the research. And if they found out that uh, the research or, or the, the um, uh, workers who were being surveyed from a particular company were being hurt, they covered up the data. This is uh, the same thing happened in the, with the asbestos industry where the uh, 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 Johns Manville, which was the premier company, uh, in the industry in, in the uh, th uh, basically uh, th uh, throughout uh, 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 throughout the twentieth century um, what what uh, Manville did was pressure the public health service not to release information that showed for example that uh, asbestos was a human carcinogen could cause lung cancer and it could cause mesothelioma, which is a cancer for which there is uh, effectively no cure. So they organized against protecting the worker in this industry. Exactly, and that's why there have been tens of billions of dollars of cases. There was literally a conspiracy to cover up the lethal effects of asbestos. Now, did any of these I don't know anything to, about this industry, but that's the standard operating procedure. You organize, <laughs> you organize uh, to make sure that the regulations are so lax that you don't get covered. I know nothing about this industry, and this should be a subject of, of, of more investigation. But did any of those executives uh, go to jail for conspiring to cover up health and safety dangers which think, were leading to I don't think any death? Manville executives ever went to jail. So the basically company went they got bankrupt. A, yeah. I mean, they had to pay uh, uh, billions of dollars, of, of but, but not through the workers' comp system. This were, there were third-party lawsuits and uh, based on the hazardous nature of the product. It was not through the workers' comp system. That turned out to be basically a non-starter. And okay, I, I, well, let's, anyway, let's... I'm just talking about another industry. I know nothing about this industry. It, but, but it, I mean, the, the approach that industry takes. Yeah. But in any way, getting back to, to what happened to David... Well, uh, can I ask the doctor something? Sure. Okay. Um, when David did call OSHA, all right, and they got back with him like a year later. They said that they were not, that they did not have the technology to be able to even know what they were looking for. So, so that's what they told David. You're yeah, saying. and they said they told him that they didn't have the technology. They to didn't have the technology. They didn't even know what they were plant. looking for. And they also said that, and I, it's just doesn't anybody care about human life because. They told David that the hospitals are more or less on the honor system. Well, of course, somebody's going to cause disease, cause deaths, and they're going to turn themselves in? I don't think so. 
And so, that's the so, same way the so, biotech so David, industry David, is. David discovered that, that he, was, he was sick. Well, five months and nine days after he was getting sick, but five months and nine days after he started employment in August, what he did is he ended up, after a work day, he ended up at an emergency medical care clinic, and he w had been throwing up at work. Um, he, bloody pus was coming out of his nose. Half of his face and his teeth went numb. Um, he was given a very, um, I can't think of the name of the, the antibiotic, but it was a very powerful antibiotic. He was told that he needed to see an ENT. The next day, he goes over to see an ENT. Um, What's that an ENT? Ear, nose, and throat specialist. Okay. okay. Two days after that, or two days or thereafter, he saw another ENT, and within 16 days, he had emergency sinus surgery, and the first of four. And was this reported to Cal OSHA, or what, did the company report this, or? No, they, what? my belief after all of these years investigating on all this, I mean, I'm just appalled because I keep finding more and more and more, is that around the time that David got sick, and he had worked with this powdered form of Bacillus subtilis, all right, um, their version of what they, they had found this microorganism in a peach orchard in Fresno, okay, okay. Well, what they were doing is that from a big drum, him and this other co-worker were mix, putting it in powder form into bags to be sent out, 25-pound bags, okay. And the other worker wore a respirator and David didn't. But so then one I, worker was wearing a respirator and one worker wasn't. But then I find out that this worker that they brought in after David, okay, which had also worked with Pam Marone at another company before, this is after the Monsanto to this other company, mm -hmm. Intotech I think was the name of the company, before she started. So they knew that this was dangerous. And then in But why wouldn't they tell the other workers there? You would think this may be a hazard, it may be something that we should be a little bit careful about, even if they don't even have signs up. You would think that just to protect their fellow workers that they would say let's all wear respirators. I mean, it seems like there was a high degree of uh, uh, irresponsible behavior uh, well, at, the, at this company. Well, there certainly was. I mean, it's just... Uh, Dr. Rose? Yeah, I also want to talk about irresponsible behavior at OSHA, Cal OSHA. Yes. Uh, when you're called in uh, and uh, a worker has possibly picked up a, uh, a very serious infectious disease from the work process, you don't just go in and me measure a face velocity and give a, and give a tag. You've <laughs> got to do some, you know, real investigation, go over all the medical records, sure. and you've got to uh, get the organism and submit it to the proper lab to determine its pathogenicity. In other words, it's a series of steps you would take because you're not only trying to protect all the workers there now and future workers, but you also have to protect the community when mm -hmm. you're talking about an infectious disease. This is a serious public health matter. So looking at what OSHA did, uh, I'm just astounded that, uh, that, that they had that kind of you know, very weak response, inappropriate response, according to the law. The law states that you have to go through this kind of process, and you certainly can't fire a worker who's complaining. Also, OSHA should have responded within 72 hours. That's required by law in this kind of, you know, complaint. And uh, I don't know what they were doing, but they obviously handled the thing. So illegally. it sounds like pretty much David was on his own. Yes. And and so he got he got he got sick. Now this mucus. Well, this oh, there was, was after. No, now also I he understand left. there was a sick out uh, of other people at the laboratory. Well, at it the wasn't laboratory. a sick out. When David got sick and then he had surgery, and he was off for a while, and then he went back, and I didn't realize this, but I, I had it wrong. I thought that he found out yeah. right when he went back to work that 11 other people in the lab, the whole lab, got sick. He found this out nine months after that, and he'd already left the company. And he, um, So was this reported to OSHA or reported well, to? Well, I don't think so. It should, I said, David told me, he said, Mom, if I would have known when I went back, I would have called the health department, I would have called the ep epidemiologist, mm -hmm. he said, the, for the whole lab to go down. And the receptionist was told by Pam Marone, I believe it was Pam Marone, to shut and lock the lab door. 
So something is very wrong here. Yeah, now, now we went to, so he didn't know what he had. He had sinus surgeries. He eventually ends up in the Mayo, Mayo Clinic. Well, and, that was in 2003. And what, what did he find out at the Mayo Clinic? When he went to the Mayo Clinic, Mayo and the Clinic. reason he went to the Mayo Clinic is a doctor that wasn't affiliated with Sutter, who Pamarone sits on the board of trustees of, mm -hmm. which was all of other David's doctors. This one doctor said, you need to get away from this group of doctors. So he set him up to go to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And he had so much pressure in his sinuses that he couldn't even fly. So I, I drove him over. Mm -hmm. And um, they found histo yeast in his blood. Now histo yeast is what they're saying is from bat droppings. I don't know how he got that. You know, well, they're yeah, bringing you, microorganisms in from the soil from all over. And you did a, a chart, uh, which we're gonna put up on the screen. You, you did a chart actually tracking some of the patents Yes. of products developed by the scientists at uh, AgriQuest. And these patents, this material uh, that the patents were represented were actually were discovered in his body? Is that? Um, there were 19 microorganisms, both uh, bacteria and fungus. They were either found, the histo was found in his blood. The others were found either in sputum cultures or IgG levels to show how much exposure that he was to these, and they were they were positive to very high positive. So his body was really infected. To everything that was in that lab. Yeah. Or now, now y y at this point, I understand, he, he filed a, a worker's comp complaint. Well, that was a joke. And and so he filed this complaint, and what, what was the response of the company, Pam Marone and the company? Well, we didn't find it out. He sought his employee file in 2000 in writing to an attorney citing federal and state law. They ignored it. The company and, and they, them ignored it. When he filed for the workers' compensation in 2003, and that's the reason that he did that is it's like, he didn't believe that somebody would do this to him. He, had, he was in total disbelief that this could really happen. And when he went to the Mayo Clinic, he had looked in the Mayo Clinic um, medical library and found that Bacillus subtilis was not as safe as they were saying it was, okay? So he had been lied to by them. Well, he'd been he'd lied to. He'd been given to. false information. Right. So, so you filed a, he eventually filed a workers' comp complaint and they denied it. Well, then we found out in 2004, because of a subpoena to get his records, that when David submitted the application for the, uh, the um, workers' compensation, I'm not sure the exact form mm -hmm. that you call it, and it goes to the employer. Then the employer fills it out. Well, they listed the wrong insurance company. So they put an incorrect insurance sure company Sure they in. did, and, and, and the denial letter went back to AgriQuest, and they never even tried to, to correct their error. David had to find out himself by calling the insurance rating bureau in San Francisco who the carrier was. So but he eventually when, finds it's at Liberty Mutual or Golden Eagle. The Golden Eagle slash Liberty Mutual. Yeah. And so this Liberty Mutual denies it. Yeah, and it was denied 285 days after it was filed, which the law says 90 days. However, for some reason, it went through the workers' comp system and it ended up at the appeals level. Now, now, now during this time, he's going to the hospital. He's getting infusions. He's having tests. What's an he's infusion? He's taking drugs. In, uh, a, a transfusion? A tra no, 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 his B cells around, around 2003 yeah. went down. Right. And um, he had to go in. At first, he was getting injections. Immune, uh, Gabaglobulin. Gabaglobulin. Just in the injections Gabaglobulin. at the doctors. Uh -huh. And then he was told that he would have to go in every 28 days, possibly for life, and have immunoglobulin infusions because his B cell, he wasn't producing B cells the way that he should. So in 2003, 2004, 2005, he went in. And who was paying for this? Uh, Medicare. So, and we have here David Bell's medical bills paid between 1999 and 2005. Uh, now this is quite a, a large, uh, list of bills. 
These are all the bills. Prescriptions. Prescriptions, um, bills, bills, infusions. And, and how much? Surgeries. Uh, surgeries. And how much did this amount to? This, and this is only through 2005, is over $333,000. Each infusion costs between eight, seven or eight and $15,000. So in, so and in other had words, violent reactions so in other words, the, the taxpayer, the, the, the people of the United States have paid 300, over $330,000 to, to take care of David's, well, uh, David's uh, problems, medical problems, and this company, Liberty Mutual and Pam Barone say that all his infections and all the stuff in his body, which you've documented. They say he was a disgruntled worker and was fired, which he never knew. Well, whatever. They, so they're saying he's a disgruntled worker. That's, that's what they're saying. And, and apparently. But, but I have to correct you. Not all of this was paid by solely Medicare because then he had a supplemental insurance, Blue Cross, and then he had his co pays. So, so, but, so but we, we, it sounds it like basically that this company. Uh, is basically cost shifting. They're, sure. de they're denying that they are responsible for these medical problems. Now, now, uh, Dan, you've written in your book about the whole issue of workers' comp, and, and this is an incredible case of somebody who actually is, shows that there are patents from this company which are in the, his body, and yet they're denying that... Or patents or microorganisms, or microorganisms that they were I mean, working it, against. Again, I mean, it seems like there's a systemic problem. Well... Uh, it sure sounds that way. What, what else can I say? It sure sounds that way. And I think there's always been a tendency to try to blame the individual worker. And I, you know, when I was, when I was writing this book uh, year, uh, years ago, I remember looking up, uh, and I don't know if it's changed that much since then, but in 1966 I found the American Handbook of Psychiatry had uh, what they call the examples of a variety of syndromes and situations which may merit the attention of a psychiatrist. And so one occupational syndrome, accident syndrome, and it's the clinical, the, di the clinical diagnosis is impulsive character and anxiety reaction. Here's another syndrome, moonlighting. In other words, someone works a lot of overtime. Compulsive personal personality, often with marital problems. Here's another one, pulmonary insufficiency, pneumoconiosis, emphysema, chronic bronchitis. The dynamic diagnosis associated with it is depressive reaction, anxiety reaction, psychophysiological reaction, or asthma. Then here's another occupational syndrome, women employees. And the uh, di associated diagnosis is physiological cycles. Now this is a long time ago, 1966. Here's another one, grievance proneness, paranoid personality, compulsive personality, depressive reaction. So the idea is, you know, and, and the authors made no plea to, you know, for, for careful examination. And the tendency is to say, this person's crazy. This person's a nut. This person has something wrong. I mean, there are crazy people in the workforce, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what they want to do is blame the worker so they don't have to pay. They don't have to assume responsibility. And, and this particular worker, one of the workers that actually was wearing the respirator, then filed after David had left this company, a year after he'd left. Well, not quite a year. Nearly a year. He files a, a uh, restraining it, he, order he against, tried to against get a David Bell? Temporary restraining order against him. For what? Oh, he said he was afraid of David. So a year after he left the company. What well, wasn't a whole year? Nearly a year. Yes. He tries to get a temporary restraining order against David. Yes, which was instigated by the company. I mean, David. David represented his, himself, and when he was in the court, you know, he asked, are you getting paid to be here? And his immediate supervisor, who was the safety officer at AgriQuest, was there, plus the person who filed the, the suit against him. And that's when, like I said, that's when he first found out he was fired. He was told his position was being terminated because he was hired for a period of six months to possibly a year and he'd already been there nine months and he was given one thousand four hundred and forty one dollars in severance pay and he was given a letter of recommendation you know if you're fired but see it's believed that David was just up and down up and down now, up and down they, have, they didn't want him around anybody there and, and they had uh, Pri secrecy agreements or privacy agreements that they have the workers in biotech sign 
to protect supposedly the patents and the secrets of the company. And David was, was worried that if he went public about what was going on at this company, he might be sued for giving away secrets and that kind of thing. These privacy agreements... Uh, well, David thought that when you're working with something that's patentable or patented, what you have to do is you have to sign a um, pr proprietary agreement and then there's something else out of there I can't remember. But David only thought that it was for 18 months. So at one point after he had left around Christmas time he had uh, he had contacted his ex-supervisor you know and, and um, said that within a certain amount of time then you know that you're sitting on a fantastic product here. You know it could save the world and I don't know why you're doing this and the the whole thing, but what happened is is that she ended up, Pam Marone somehow ended up in her hands. This was an email. She sends it out to all agriquesters, okay, like he's a big threat. Oh, he's threatening the company. Now, now he appealed. Uh, I mean, threatening the company's financial status right. or threatening to blow it? The information. No, I think the Releasing information. Status. I mean, I think the, the, she was saying that he was releasing information about the company which was would harm the company. And that's, you know, that's basically trying to say that he was a danger to the company but see, because product, he was... But yeah. when he was let go, he wasn't even given a copy of that. Okay. Now, after... So he appealed this the, the denial of workers' comp. Yeah. Okay. And then you went in front of another judge, and this other judge, what, what who was that judge's name? Susan Dugan. Susan Dugan, who was a workers' Suzanne comp... Suzanne Dugan. Suzanne Dugan, who was a workers' comp appeals judge. And she looked at this case... And then how did she rule? Huh. She denied everything. It's at the judge's discretion. Oh. It's at the judge's discretion whether they will admit new evidence. And the defense attorney had asked for David's social security records and where he is living now. And he knew by getting this under a subpoena that David was then facing another sinus surgery he knew when he got into the Social Security Medicare records that David had never been sick before like that. He'd had seasonal allergies. You know, his nose ran. He, his, he can't even get his nose to run because it's so thick. And, and we have a out. video of, of yeah. the nose. Uh, it's like a plastic, almost, a, a substance coming out the mucus. Like hyperplastic. It's like hyperplastic that's, that's coming out of his, uh, of his body. Now, so she rules against you. She ruled against David would not would not allow any evidence in even though the the defense attorney had already so she she basically shut you down yeah and I was a witness and, and she wouldn't even let me take the now stand. now it turns out now that this this judge formerly a, a lawyer representing she represented who well that was a shock I go on the internet and do a search on her and find out that she used to be an attorney for Liberty um, um, for a law firm that was represent that represented Liberty Mutual. <laughs> Outrageous. And so this, and she didn't, of course, recuse herself and say. Oh, she didn't. I say mean, I've to I've worked for a law firm that's representing the same company that I'm handling well, the case with. Had ten years prior to yeah. that. But she was a representative of insurance company. And then the who appellate was sitting on as a judge. The board, the appellate board, their last denial for a motion for reconsideration was something like, well, even if it was true about the judge, it doesn't make any difference. Now, there is a, a, a Workers' Memorial Day on April 27th. It's going to be in the town of Davis. And Workers' Memorial Day is celebrated all over the world if you go to workersmemorialday.com. And there are going to be speakers. There are other injured workers who, in fact, are having the same problem of getting their health care taken care of. And it seems to be a growing problem of, of workers. And this is how really we found out about your case, and that is he couldn't get his health care taken care of. Uh, Dan, I mean, it seems like there's a complete breakdown of the workers' comp system that, that workers such as David Bell and others just can't get their health care taken care of. What, the, what, <clears throat> what, what any uh, uh, insurance carrier and employer fears the most is, is a permanent partial, a permanent total disability where, where uh, someone has to be taken care of for a long period of time. Now, the kind of uh, accident where someone breaks an arm or, or sprains an ankle and they're off the job for a few days, uh, that's not a, uh, and there are many, many cases. But uh, when we look carefully at the, at the numbers, uh, when we looked at, at the, the uh, 
uh, political economy or the, 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 the economics of, of workers' comp losses, we found that 2% of the cases cost 50% of the losses. Those are the cases that the insurance comp carriers and the employers fight, fight the strongest. It's where the worker really needs it that is where they're least likely to get care and get compensation. And that's, that's and, the, and the sounds, logic of the system. And, and it sounds like this is, is a prime case. Well, also, this is a case, obviously, where they don't, they don't see, it's not a, a listed occupational disease like, for example, asbestosis. Sure. And, uh, you know, there are or so silicosis. It's very, so very, it's, it's new, and it, it, sometimes it'll take, uh, you know, many, decades. Many years, if yeah. any. Yeah. And we didn't even talk about the, the, yeah. uh, the bees dying that may be as a result of this and the, and the, and the uh, bats and that kind of thing. So I want to thank you all for, for being here. I think we've had a good discussion. This won't be the last time yes. that we deal with it. But I think for injured workers, uh, the need and, and the public, the need to focus on the issue of injured workers, workers who have killed on the job, and what is going on in this crisis has to be taken seriously. You, I want to thank you. you can't control me, you know me. I've had it up to here with your lies and your ties.